Hello and welcome to another tutorial. My name is James Piper. I'm a senior fellow and clinical lecturer in acute medicine. This uh, tutorial is on acute headaches. As always, if you have any questions, you can email them to me at james.piper at ucl.ac.uk. Please don't forget to like, share and subscribe to the Acute Medicine YouTube channel. In this talk, I'm going to talk about the epidemiology and prevalence of headaches how to take a good headache history, differential diagnosis in acute headache, and uh, red flag headaches. And red flag headaches are particularly important for us as acute physicians to be able to recognise. Headache is a very common presentation uh, to general practice, to the emergency department, and for us in acute medicine. Um, and so we see the vast majority of headaches um, that come in through the front door. So it is important, therefore, that we know how to differentiate those that are um, uh, less serious and those that we can discharge and those that need further investigation. When we have a look at the prevalence of headache, this is data from The Lancet from 2016, you can see that there's a particularly European um, prevalence of headache um, with a point prevalence of about 20 to 21,000 uh, per 100,000 uh, population. When we think about the different categories of headache, um, they mostly uh, fall into um, primary tension type headache, and that accounts for about 40% um, of headache presentations. Then you have my primary migraine, which accounts for about 10%, and uh, tax or trigeminal autonomic cephalgias, and these are things like trigeminal neuralgia, and these present less than 1%. Um, and also secondary medication overuse headache. And this is particularly things like codeine, and I'll discuss medication overuse headache in a bit more detail later. When we look at the prevalence of tension, headaches and migraine, as always with any acute disease and presentation, it's important that you have a rudimentary understanding of the epidemiology um, of that disease process. And so when we look at uh, the prevalence of tension headache, you can see um, that uh, it is far more common um, in females by about a factor of two compared to males. And also the particular age range uh, for uh, tension headaches and migraine uh, is particularly between uh, the second and fourth decades of life. What's also important to understand is that although um, migraines and tension type headaches are common, particularly in younger people, that they do have a significant level of associated disability. And so on the left hand side, you have global years of lives lost with disability. So, for example, this counts as numbers of days of work um, and also um, lost productivity, which ultimately there in therefore cost billions of pounds in economic terms. So these are this is a, um, a significant um, cause of time off work uh, and associated problems. Um, and so, as you can see, um, that is a significant um, number of uh, lives, uh, sorry, lives lost with disability. Now, what's the good news for us as acute physicians? Well, the good news is, is that about 90% of headaches fall into a number of categories. Have a think about what you what categories they might be. And so 90% of headaches fall into these following groups. So tension headache, migraine, sinus headaches, and cluster headaches. And so this is quite reassuring because actually, um, when a lot of patients present to the emergency department and acute medicine with a headache, um, usually we can actually categorise um, the headache into one of these four. But again, of course, it does um, uh, mean that you need to have taken um, a good uh, medical history. So what I'd like you to do here is um, I just want you to pause the video here, give yourself five to ten minutes, have a think about this question that a patient is referred to acute medicine with a headache. What would you focus on in the history? Again, pause the video here, take some time, scribble down some thoughts. The next slide has the answers. It's important to take specific details when you are taking a headache history. And these are some of the things that you might want to think about when taking a history. So for example, the age at onset, 
the presence or absence of aura and prodrome, the frequency, intensity and duration of the attack, number of headaches days per month. And again, this can be helpful to a particularly chronic headache, asking the patient to document a headache diary. The number of headache days per month, and again, this is quite important in the diagnosis of cluster headache. The time and mode of onset, the quality, site and radiation of the pain, associated symptoms and abnormalities. Family history of migraine, precipitating and relieving factors, and exacerbation or relief with change in position. And this is particularly important if you are concerned about headache causing raised intracranial pressure. And finally, the effect of activity on pain. So that's the first half of the list. The second half of the list include things like response to previous treatments, a review of current medications such as anticoagulants if you are concerned about the risk of intracerebral hemorrhage or subdural hematoma causing pressure and mass effect, non-prescribed medications, so herbal remedies that may cause headache, any recent, uh, recent change in vision, again, this can be quite important for things like optic neuritis in multiple sclerosis, um, uh, pituitary macroadenoma and space occupying lesions. Association with recent trauma, changes in sleep, exercise, weight or diet, uh, general health, change in work or lifestyle, change in method of contraception, association with environmental factors and finally effects of menstrual cycle and exogenous hormones. Now we've taken history, of course, we want to um, clinically assess our patients. And again, I'd like you to take a couple of minutes and pause the slide here to think about how you might assess someone who presents to acute medicine uh, with an acute headache. These are some of the important things to think about when assessing someone with acute headache. You want a measure of their blood pressure and pulse. This is particularly important for things like hypertensive encephalopathy, Brewery for cerebro and cardiovascular disease, head, neck and shoulder region. So, for example, tension type, muscle spasm and um, osteoarthritis, temporal and neck artery. So, for example, um, temporal arteritis as seen in the picture here um, and other um, arteritis and vasculitis. Spine and neck muscles, again, for uh, tension and spasm. Mental state, so any signs of encephalitis or meningitis. Cranial nerves, fundoscopy or otoscopy, in case this is a non-headache um, um, cause such as um, dental problems, um, mouth ulcers, um, ENT problems and so on. And of course their gait for any signs of cerebellar disease. Now given that most headaches can either be classified into a tension type or a migraine, it is important that you are aware of the characteristics of migraine tension type and cluster headache syndromes and this is a extract from up to date so for example a migraine um, in adults is often unilateral in 60 to 70 percent bifrontal or global in about 30 percent of patients it's gradually in, uh, in onset has a crescendo pattern and patients often describe it as pulsating uh, moderate or severe intensity and aggravated by routine um, physical activity Patients will often prefer to rest with a migraine in a dark, quiet room. The duration is about 4 to 72 hours. And this is quite important in the definition and diagnosis of a thunderclap headache. Um, patients often will uh, mix the um, characteristics of a, a thunderclap headache and a migraine, as can other medical professionals. So it is important that you do um, take clearly what the definition um of a migraine and thunderclap headache is, and we will come to that in a, in a while. Associated symptoms of migraine include nausea, vomiting, photophobia, phonophobia, and may have aura, but they can involve other senses or cause speech and motor deficits. A simple tension type headache is usually bilateral, has pressure or tightness which waxes and wanes. Patients will tend to remain active, um, or at least they'll functionally be able to be active, or they may need to take some rest. The duration of a tension type headache um, can last from uh, 30 minutes to seven days. And this is quite important to know because um, paradoxically, GPs will often refer us patients 
who have had a headache for a number of weeks or a week at a time and after a few days of headache that's when people get concerned as opposed to paradoxically in more significant things such as thunderclap headache which is extremely brief um, or a significant migraine which will only last four to 72 hours we tend to get referrals from patients who have had a headache um, for five days and beyond and actually this is more likely to be epidemiologically a tension type headache there are no obvious associated symptoms in a tension type headache a cluster headache, on the other hand, is always unilateral. And again, it's important that you take um, your history carefully and usually begins around the eye or the temple. Now, similarly to a thunderclap headache, however, patient pain begins quickly and reaches a crescendo within minutes. Pain is deep, continuous, excruciating and explosive in quality. Now, again, the, the important differential here is that cluster headache is always unilateral. Um, and subarachnoid hemorrhage headaches are not. They tend to be, but not always, occipital um, or bitemporal. So the key here is to know that your patient has a unilateral headache. Patient remains active and the duration is from 15 minutes to 3 hours. Now, the other important differential in a cluster headache is the fact that there are associated symptoms. Most commonly, these are ipsilateral lacrimation or redness of the eye, stuffy nose, rhinorrhea, pallor, sweating, or Horner's syndrome, restlessness or agitation. Vocal and neurological symptoms are rare. So my, it's also important to be aware of migraine triggers, and these include things like stress, menstruation, visual stimulus, temperature changes, nitrates, fasting uh, wine sleep disturbances and aspartame which is uh, used as an artificial sweetener tension type headaches may also have pericranial tenderness so bearing in mind how common uh, headache is it's important for us as acute physicians to at least identify those headaches um, which are likely to be low risk Low risk headaches include um, patients who are aged less than 50 years old, features typical of a primary headache, which we have discussed, a history of a similar migraine, no neurological features, no concerning change in usual headache pattern, no high risk comorbid conditions, and no new or concerning findings on history or examination. I'm going to give you here um, what's known as a migraine screening tool or PIN and this has um, a sensitivity um, of about 84% if two out of the three are identified. And the three questions are, so P for photophobia, did light bother you a lot more than when you do not have headaches? I, incapacity, did your headaches limit your ability to work, study, activity for at least one day? And N, nausea, did you feel nauseated? And as I said, the sensitivity of this is about 84% for migraine if two out of the three are positive. Now, your next activity is to think about what are the features of a dangerous or red flag headache? And some of those I've already touched on. Again, pause the video here, take some time um, to think about what features of a headache um, would concern you. So these are some of the uh, features of red flag headaches and these include um, systemic symptoms including fever, um, again this would be thinking, making you think about meningitis, cancer history or current as i.e. concerns about metastases and space occupying lesions, neurological deficit, older age, so they are more prone to, for example, temporal arteritis, and temporal arteritis, for example, is never seen um, in patients who are aged less than 50. A pattern change or recent onset of a new headache, positional headache, precipitated by sneezing, coughing, or exercise, the feature and presence of papilledema, a progressive headache or atypical presentations, pregnancy or purpurium with the risk to central venous um, sinus thrombosis, painful eye with autonomic features such as an optic neuritis, post-trauma immune pathology such as HIV, and analgesia overuse or a new drug at headache onset. So I'm just going to go through now some pearls and pitfalls that are seen in the recognition and management of acute headache. So it's important to note that a strictly unilateral headache is associated with an increased likelihood of a secondary headache, such as cervicogenic headache. 
The presence of vi um, impaired vision or halos around light should make you concerned that the patient has presented with acute glaucoma. The presence of visual field defects should prompt you to think about an optic pathway lesion such as a pituitary mass. Sudden severe unilateral vision loss should make you concerned for optic neuritis and is an ophthalmic emergency. The blurring of vision on forward bending of the head, double vision and loss of coordination should make you concerned about a raised intracranial pressure. Obese women of a childbearing age often tend to be idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Symptoms and signs such as nausea, vomiting, neurological deficits, papilledema, seizures and changes in headache pattern should make you concerned about a space occupying lesion. Conversely, the presence of intermittent headaches, sweating and tachycardia and persistent hypertension should make you think about one of my favourite words, pheochromosotoma. So headache emergencies are ones that we suspect have a thunderclap headache, patients who have acute or subacute neck pain with a Horner syndrome and or neurological deficit, as this would make you concerned about cervical artery dissection, um, I've seen one patient have this in the fact the patient was otherwise quite well and dissected um, their uh, vertebral artery whilst swimming. Headache with orbital or periorbital symptoms such as acute glaucoma, infection, inflammation, thrombosis and tumour, suspected air meningitis and encephalitis, headache with fe uh, global or focal deficits or papal edema. This here is a reminder of what a Horner syndrome looks like. These are the Osis sisters, meiosis, ptosis and anhydrosis. So the Osis sisters, meiosis, excessive pupil constriction, ptosis and anhydrosis or no sweating. On the right hand side of the slide, this is a extreme example of papal edema. Now we're going to have a quick look at the algorithms governing the management and uh, of acute headache. So first of all, if you have a patient who presents with um, a new or severe headache, um, you're going to make sure that there's no possibility that this is carbon monoxide poisoning. Now, that's relatively rare in the United Kingdom, except for the presence of a patient who has been admitted with um, after a house fire. So generally speaking, carbon monoxide poisoning is relatively rare outside um, a fire. If you do suspect possible carbon monoxide poisoning, then the treatment is to initiate 100% um, oxygen and start co-oximetry um, of their carboxyhemoglobin levels. So you do a venous blood gas. The next thing to identify that's critically important is to identify if there was a sudden uh, thunderclap headache raising suspicion for subarachnoid hemorrhage. If it's yes, you're then going to proceed to an emergent non-contrast CT and this is what we're going to talk about next. So if there are concerns about thunderclap headache, then you are going to arrange an emergency non-contrast head CT. And this is effectively to make sure that it is safe to perform lumbar puncture. If you perform lumbar puncture in the presence of raised intracranial pressure, it's possible that once you put the needle in and pull it out, there's a risk of coning, uh, which can be fatal. If there is evidence of a subarachnoid hemorrhage or intracranial lesion on CT, we obviously discuss it with the neurosurgeons and call the neurologists. If there are no acute findings on the CT, then we'll perform lumbar puncture, ideally after 12 hours, especially if you are concerned about subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, because if you perform it less than 12 hours after the onset of headache, it is unreliable for xanthochromia. If the lumbar puncture is non-diagnostic, then it may be worth that we'll perform a MRI of the head or magnetic resonance angiogram or magnetic resonant venogram to evaluate for other causes of a thunderclap headache. And these include um, cerebral venous thrombosis. These tend to be seen um, in women, tend to be seen in patients who are pregnant. Uh, cervical artery dissection, pituitary apoplexy, reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndromes and spontaneous intracranial hypotension. Um, venous thrombosis is relatively rare as are dissections, um, but ap apoplexy, um, reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndromes and spontaneous intracranial hypotension are even rarer and it's important to bear that in mind. If so next, if there is fever and suspicion of meningitis or high suspicion for meningitis or encephalitis, then you're going to see if you can identify patients who have high risk features for intracranial lesion. And these include immunocompromised patients, 
a history of CNS disease, new onset seizures, papal edema, altered consciousness and focal neurological deficit. If there are, then you're going to undertake an emergency CT head, and if a lesion is discovered, then again you will refer the patients to neurology and neurosurgery. If not, and the index of encephalitis is high, then you should obviously perform start blood cultures, give antibiotics, perform a lumbar puncture, and the patient may need uh, dexamethasone. If the LP findings are benign, then it may be um, that further neuroimaging, such as an MRI head, is warranted. If the patient's uh, LP is consistent with meningitis, then of course you would treat accordingly. If, however, there is no fever and no meningitis or other suspicion for infection, and so um, and there are one of but if there are one or more of these features present, um, then you are likely to um, need further neuroimaging, and these include papilledema, seizures, new neurological ab abnormalities, severely elevated blood pressure, predominant nocturnal or morning headache. Headache that is worse with um, Valsalva or precipitated by cough, exertion or sexual activity and the patient is aged 40 and above. And so it is likely therefore that you should then perform an RI head with contrast or a CT head with contrast, although MRI head with contrast is preferred because of its higher yield. And this would be looking for diagnoses such as giant cell arteritis, acute glaucoma, optic neuritis, uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension, pheochromocytoma, acute herpes simplex, uh, post-hepatic neuralgia and trigeminal neuralgia. Pre if there is a previous headache history but now with um, progressive or significant change in the headache then again neuroimaging would be appropriate. So it's important to know the definition of a thunderclap headache. And a thunderclap headache is a very severe headache of abrupt onset that reaches its maximum intensity with one minute or less of onset. The key feature that differentiates a thunderclap headache from other headaches is the rapidity with which it develops. Extreme severity of a headache alone is not sufficient. The primary symptom of aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage is a sudden severe headache. Approximately one half of patients with subarachnoid hemorrhage present with a thunderclap headache. Now, while there are no signs or symptoms that can reliably differentiate prior primary from secondary thunderclap headache, the following features are associated with increased odds of a subarachnoid hemorrhage being present, and they include impaired consciousness, neck stiffness, nausea or vomiting, exertion or valsalva immediately preceding the onset of thunderclap headache, elevated blood pressure, occipital headache, and a history of smoking. The intense pain is caused by fresh blood from probably a ruptured aneurysm into the subarachnoid space. Uh, and this is what you can see um, in this uh, image here. Now, when we then go and have a look at the CT, we can then see this further. Uh, so this is uh, an image from Radiopedia. You can see here, on if you look on the left-hand side of the image, you can see the um, fresh blood in the subarachnoid spaces. And so um, the yield of CT is especially high if the patient presents after the thunderclap headache within four to six hours. And in the right neurologist's hands, um, sensitivity and specificity can be as close as 96 to 98%. So it is worth getting to the hospital if your patient has a thunderclap headache ASAP. Now, primary headache associated with sexual activity is rare. One Danish population-based study found that the lifetime prevalence of a sexual headache was about 1%. In a case series from Germany, however, of 51 patients with a sexual headache, the mean age at onset was 35, and the male-to-female ratio was about 2.9 to 1. In these patients with sexual headache, comorbid migraine, benign exertional headache and tension type headaches, they were also present in 25, 29 and 45% respectively. Other reports indicate that sexual headache um, can be present at any um, age. The diagnostic um, criteria for a primary sexual headache um, are listed on the slide here. Medication overuse headache. Diagnostic criteria for medication overuse headache is a headache occurring on 15 or more days per month in a patient with a pre-existing headache disorder and regular overuse for more than three months 
of one or more drugs that can be taken for acute and or symptomatic treatment of headache, in particularly codeine. In addition, for ergotamine, triptans and opioids in combination, analgesics intake must be 10 or more uh, days per month to be considered overuse. For more simple analgesics, such as non steroidal anti-inflammatories, including aspirin and paracetamol, intake must be 15 days or more per month to be considered overuse. Now, just to start to summarise, it's important also to consider other pathology-associated headache. So be mindful of headaches that might be caused by a trauma or injury to the head or neck. Cranial or cervical vascular disorders, for example, intracerebral hemorrhage, central venous thrombosis or giant cell arteritis. Non-vascular intracranial disorders, for example, idiopathic intracranial hypertension or space occupying lesion. Exposure to or withdrawal from a substance such as carbon monoxide, cocaine, alcohol or other medication. Infection, for example, a cranial infection such as meningitis and encephalitis and cerebral abscess. Disorders of homeostasis, so for example, hypoxia, hypertension and uh, conditions in pregnancy such as preeclampsia and eclampsia. Disorders of the cranium, neck, eyes, ears, nose, sinuses, teeth, mouth or other facial or cranial structural um, such as angle closure, closure glaucoma, temporomandibular disorder, dental problems, otitis media or sinusitis. Also, uh, headaches may be seen in psychiatric disorders such as somatiz somatization disorder and painful cranial neuropathies and other facial pains such as trigeminal neuralgia, post-herpetic neuralgia and optic neuritis. On this slide here, you can see that you've got a patient who's got shingles and on the right hand side, this is a patient who has an abscess of their dental implant. On this slide here, you can see a carotid artery dissection where you can see the true lumen and the false lumen. And you can also see that in the longitudinal plane. On the right hand side, the CT, you can see that you have a fluid filled um, sinus um, and inflammation of the ethmoid cells. And so this patient has acute sinusitis. Now, how you manage acute headache does depend, of course, on the cause. So, for example, in a tension type headache, um, non steroidals and aspirin uh, should usually um, suffice to help treat the tension type headache. In the presence of migraine, tryptan, simple analgesics and antiemetics um, are useful. In a space occupying lesion, of course, then the treatment is dexamethasone, radiotherapy plus minus surgery. For a subarachnoid hemorrhage, the treatment includes novotropine and coiling and other interventional radiology strategies. Medication overuse headache includes reduction of the medication and ed patient education. Um, neuralgia can include medications such as carbamazepine and general headaches in, uh, can be treated with fluids and dealing with any stresses that the patients have. Thank you for listening to this YouTube tutorial. As always, you can email me if you have any questions. Um, take care, everybody, and I'll bring another video soon.